So um, this, <laughs> this is a study uh, which actually isn't in the geographic bounds of, like uh, uh, David was talking about this morning, um, but it's began in the geographic bound. So it's work that we started uh, almost um, uh, 10 years ago now. Uh, I just on my first slide uh, acknowledged Deakin University, which is where, where I'm partly based as well as Barrow Health Services, but I should also <coughs> have acknowledged the University of New South Wales, which is where I'm doing my PhD. But so um, in 2014, uh, Barrow Health Services and Alzheimer's National put an application in for a funding grant to roll out what we call the Dementia Care and Hospital Programs nationally, and we were very lucky to, uh, to succeed in that application. So what I'm presenting uh, at some point, uh, when, when, when that happens, uh, I'm presenting uh, just the protocol for, for what we're going to be doing in this study as, as the first part of uh, uh, of the work um, and I guess I want that we can go to the next slide um, so this is the the study team um, I work with a brilliant group of, uh, of nurses uh, as well as uh, uh, Sean McDermott who's uh, my the project manager who might be in the audience somewhere uh, unless he's not, yes he's right at the back there um, but Meredith Theobald is um, uh, the, now the director of subacute medicine at Barrett Health Services but was the first clinical nurse consultant in cognition uh, in Australia uh, at Ballard Health Services. Michelle Morville is now the clinical nurse consultant in cognition. Um, and there's myself and Sam Blake is our uh, Alzheimer's uh, Australia national member of the, of the advisory team nationally. Um, and then Deakin University is our national evaluation team uh, acknowledging the uh, Department of Population Health. So Jenny Watts, Lisa Lane and our biostatistician um, uh, Mah Mohammed Reza Mohabi. So uh, we're working with four partner hospitals, um, and I'll just uh, note them, but again noting that in fact what we're working with here is, is an interdisciplinary uh, group of people, both doctors and nurses, um, and in fact one of our project officers is a physiotherapist. Um, so I'll just acknowledge that, the, so that we're basically picking up the eastern, uh, the, southern, uh, the southern seaboard uh, of Australia um, with Western Australia taking up all the Western seaboard. These sites will become eventually, we hope once we've rolled out the Dementia Care Hospitals program to them, lead sites in their own states. So they will become the statewide educator for the Dementia Care and Hospitals program. So let me just briefly introduce the Dementia Care and Hospitals program, next slide. Um, so uh, it, it did begin uh, as a program with the longest title in the world, but this title is important uh, because it actually indicates the fundamentals of the program uh, in, in that it's an all of hospital education program. So we're not talking about just educating clinicians, we're talking about non-clinicians as well. So we wanted to build in the ward clerks, the porters, the cleaners uh, into this model. Uh, it want, is aimed at improving awareness of uh, people with cognitive impairment and uh, and communication with people with dementia. And just to be clear about the language, this was all funded by the dementia parts of various organisations, various governments, and there was no way they were going to let us use the word cognitive impairment because they wanted dementia very safely labelled on this, but this is all about cognitive impairment. It doesn't actually, this program doesn't look at dementia alone, it looks at the functional problem of cognitive impairment, which will include delirium as well as dementia and potentially also, and it does, a number of people with stroke related injury which re results in cognitive impairment that wouldn't otherwise be defined as either delirium more dementia. But most importantly, or secondly, it's, it's linked to a visual cognitive impairment identifier, which is a visual graphic. And this, if we go to the next slide, is what we've done over the last nine years. Um, we began uh, with people with dementia and their families, because we want to ask them the question, well, if we stuck up a sign over your bed to say there was something going wrong with your brain, how would you feel about it? And would that be okay? And there's a lot of personal taboos around this concept, um, because, uh, you know, this wasn't something that was done normally, yet there are other, there are other impairments, uh, visual and hearing impairments, which don't have visual stigmata attached to them because you can't actually pick up someone's blind or deaf unless they indicate that to you. Um, in hospitals where we were using alerts, so the system was able to meet a disability that we couldn't actually necessarily identify quickly. And people with dementia and their families, there was 39 in our focus group. We did some qualitative analysis of their stories about their experience within healthcare. And that developed for us two key learnings. One about what sort of identifier, what alert would you like over the bedside? What should it look like? And they really didn't like my fuzzy brain, which I thought was perfect. Um, 
uh, and uh, what was the educational learnings? How would we change the organisation? Because it was okay to put an alert over the bedside, but that alert was for you, the organisation, not to label me, you're the patient with the problem, it was to alert you to do something different. And we want to know what, and they want to know what difference we were going to drive in the hospital system, what organisational change, what cultural change. And they stipulated a series of uh, themes. And we worked with those two, the alert and also the education. And we've actually been working with, we've worked with 25 hospitals across Victoria. We've done some really simple qualitative type uh, analysis of that which hasn't yet been published because we've been doing all the rollout and I'm not much of a publisher. Um, <laughs> and uh, so we've looked at, and we've had funding from the Department of, uh, of Health in Victoria to do that across both public services and recently, or 2013, we got a grant from uh, the Bupa Foundation to look at three private hospitals and we ran the same program there with particularly looking at carer satisfaction, staff awareness and staff perceived difficulty with care with changes uh, which I won't go into with the next slide because I, I just wanted to, re this, this, is the, these are the, this is the engine room perhaps of the Dementia Care and Hospitals program. First of all, it's a key communication strategies. These aren't difficult to teach, but it's very difficult to change an organisation's culture so they deliver on these particular teaching tools, uh, teaching things, it's introducing yourself, you might have thought it was quite simple, but it's not. All health service providers in hospitals don't introduce themselves to their patients, they rarely do. Um, uh, and when you've got so many people making contact with an individual patient and you don't have a memory, you have a memory problem, it's very difficult to know who's actually uh, washing your backside at that particular time and whether it was the right person or was it the cleaner. Um, so you want to make sure you know that the right person is doing the right job. Um, and also there's an alert. So that is about alerting the organisation that they should be delivering these sorts of communications. And so that is what makes up the program. We'll go to the next slide because I'm, oh my God. 12 and it just goes ridiculously quickly. Um, so um, what is the study questions? The, the key study question uh, that we're asking is, does the implementation of the Dementia Care and Hospitals program result in fewer hospital acquired adverse events in patients over the age of 65 with cognitive impairment? This was the hard data that we couldn't get in our original studies. Next slide. And there's a number of prime, uh, secondary questions which comes back to the things about carer satisfaction, quality of life uh, for people with dementia and staff improved knowledge. Next slide. Next slide. Oh, I've done it. Oh, I wish I had a moment clear. Um, uh, so the population is uh, the patients over the age of 65 in acute care. The interventions there are two. The first one is screening for all patients age 65 and over for cognitive impairment using a validated tool. This is not going to be a new, this, well this is a new sort of uh, intervention, but it will be a required intervention. By 2016, the national uh, standards uh, will require accreditation, uh, accredited hospital will have to do this anyway. So we, it's been lucky that, we, well not lucky because we've driven the change in the standards, um, but we have that change in the standards. And then on top of that, then there's the Dementia Care and Hospitals program. We have the last, uh, second last slide. So these are the primary measures. We're going to use the modifiable hospital acquired adverse events. This is a set of adverse events that was defined by uh, a group uh, from uh, the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare in the Hospital Dementia Services study done in New South Wales. And what they identified was that if a, pa a patient with dementia matched for the non-dementia will have 2.5 times increased likelihood of one of these four adverse events irrespective of age or comorbidity. So we don't know why, but there is increased risk of one of those key four events, and we'll use that same methodology uh, to analyze the outcomes in, in our study. Next one. Um, we'll also measure patient quality of life using the DEMQOL. The DEMQOL is the Dementia Quality of Life Scale. It was formed by, this. So I will stop, uh, by Banerjee. Um, there's carer satisfaction scales and staff knowledge using just staff surveys and, and carer surveys. Uh, next one, uh, second last. This is the design. <laughs> It'll be a step wedge design model. Um, this is so that we can control for variables that you can't possibly control in a real life environment. We're actually going into hospitals that are doing stuff. We can't tell hospitals to stop doing stuff so we can randomise or control for one thing and another. So we're using this design so that we will have overlap between our control periods in part of the study with the intervention period. Having said that, we don't expect there's going to be major change because most of the hospitals I'm working with now are already making the change to standardised screening because they know the standards are going to change next year. And that will be the case across the board. That'll be the major change, I think, that will impact on, uh, on our data. Next slide. 
Um, so the adverse event rates are, are what we'll be looking at. Uh, we'll have somewhere between 6,000 and 9,000 participants in the study, so we're not concerned about the power to, to demonstrate change. And we've, uh, the secondary measures are all powered to have an 80% chance of finding an effect. Well, that's the second to last slide. There will be an economic evaluation. I won't go into that in great detail because I'm supposed to finish. Uh, and next one. And uh, we'll finish in May 2017 and 12 minutes is impossible. Thank you very much.